Well, guess what? We don't win down here. We lose. You ready for that? Oh, you, th oh, you were a post-millennialist. You thought we were just going to go waltzing into the kingdom as you took over the world. No. We lose here. Get it. They killed Jesus. They killed all the apostles. We're all going to be persecuted. If any man come after me, let him, what, deny himself, garbage of prosperity gospel. No, we don't win down here. Are you ready for that? Just to clear the air, I love this clarity. We don't win. We lose on this battlefield, but we win on the big one, the eternal one. Okay, so there's the section. So we lose down here, uh, but we win on the big one. Now, there's a lot, there's so much that could be said. Um, folks on Facebook and Twitter and websites. Remember when Dr. MacArthur made his comment about premillennialism and reformed theology back at the Shepherds Conference? When was that? That was. That was over a decade ago, maybe 15 years ago now, wasn't it? And Sam Waldron, I think, wrote a book. And again, in, in hindsight, it was useful because it made people think things through. And that's the way it should be. And that's appropriate. And I'm not saying that John shouldn't have the right to say, you know, now today, if anyone, if you disagree with somebody, you're saying they should be silent. No, I'm not in any way, shape or form. Did you see, by the way? why I choose, and if I'm wrong, somebody, if John clarifies himself and says, yes, I was equating post-millennialism with prosperity gospel, then let me know. But could you see why I sort of felt like the prosperity gospel thing was just sort of a throwaway statement that just popped into the mind and it wasn't meant to be a rational continuation of what was being said before? Okay, maybe I'm just being bending over to be too kind or something, but I don't think so. I want to believe that John MacArthur recognizes there's a difference between postmillennialism and the prosperity gospel. They're very, very, very different things. But do postmillennialists believe that you just go waltzing into the kingdom after you take over down here? Well, no. And I've been making the argument recently. I'm having to think all this stuff through. We live in days that at least in our experience, no one has lived through before in the Western world. It's not that the rise of the Soviet Union was not an incredible evil. It was. Millions of people died. Millions of people under Mao. Millions of people now in communist China. But those were kept to a certain portion of the human family. This is looking like it's going to be the entire human family. Globally. And now we have technocracy. Now we have technology. Our globe is surrounded by mechanical devices, electronic devices that can track us everywhere. We are facing new challenges and while the Soviets and the Chinese the last century were atheists, we now have a form of secularism that's even more virulent than existed back then. And so all of us are having to put our theology to the test. And that includes myself. And so I have described the strain and pressure of seeking to drive wisdom from Scripture as people in Scripture were persecuted for their beliefs and what it means to be faithful within the context of persecution. Combining that with the global context of secularism 
which is not what the early church faced. The unbelief of the Roman Empire, pagan as it was, was not secular. Darwin kicked open a door that allows a new level of inhumanity on the part of man. Really does. So, I have described one decision that we have to make, that all of us have to make. I think most of us, no matter what our eschatological positions are, would recognize that we are called to be faithful in whatever moment God has placed us. And I'm, I'm primarily talking about people who are reformed in their understanding that God actually places us in, God's actually accomplishing something in this world. If God has no decree, then who knows what in the world he's doing. Maybe he's confused too, if you're an open theist. But sound orthodox reformed men of differing eschatological perspectives. There is plainly a divide and that divide I have described as the difference between escapist and endurantist. Escapist and endurantist. We are either going to escape from this tribulation or we are going to endure and there is going to be on the other side a restoration, a rebuilding, that is not a part of the escapist idea where there's not going to be any of that. And so the point is, if you're on the escapist side, you are not thinking about how do you communicate the faith through the period of darkness that eventually leads to a period of great light. You're just you're going, it's getting darker, 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 boom. That's it. Don't have to worry about the transmission of the faith, the preparation of the next generations to endure you have to worry about any of that because you interpret tribulation to be something other than something that was fulfilled a long time ago. So that's the escapist view. Now, amillennialists can fall on either side because you've heard the terminology uh, optimistic amillennialism and pessimistic amillennialism. So a pessimistic millennialist might go, man, this is it's about to be wrapped up. I mean, you look at all the thing that man man's doing. We've got nuclear weapons, and we're playing with genetics now. And I mean, we're we're literally standing on the doorstep of I Am Legend together with Space Odyssey 2000 and a whole bunch of other ones all thrown into the mix. And let's just stir it all up and see what blows out of this. Uh, so it's real easy to be sitting there going, yeah, this I can't see how we can ever get out of this mess. So. There you go. That's the pessimistic side. The optimistic amillennialist uh, says, hey, it's been dark at times in the past, too. What about postmillennialists? Well, if you read meaningful postmillennial literature, you come to the recognition that postmillennialists recognize that God raises up kingdoms and takes kingdoms down. God is still doing the work of demonstrating his character through the judgment of the nations. And as I understand it, the post-millennial commitment fundamentally is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. God, in fulfilling the promise of Psalm 110.1 and 2, is putting under the feet of Jesus all his enemies, and the last enemy is death. God has started doing that God started doing that as soon as Jesus rose from the dead. He's been continuing to do that ever since then. But it's not a straight line. It seems to me that Dr. MacArthur has the idea it's a straight line and it's just straight up to heaven. That's not how it's ever been. And when I think of someone like a Rush Dooney, he knows church history. And what's attractive to me about this is I know church history. And one of the most important things for me right now is I just know that there are there have been so many times in the history of the church that if I had lived at that time, I would have been tempted to have a wrong view of the future, judging on what was happening in my day. 
You cannot determine your eschatology this way. But we all do it that way. Whether we want to admit it or not, we are tempted to do it that way, and we cannot completely avoid doing it that way. Because we're trying to look past this next thing called the next second, and we can't do it. And so I look at church history, and I see ups and downs. I see dark, dark periods, and then periods of great blessing. And it's not a line like this. It's an up and down type thing. But I see Christ's enemies being put under his feet. And it seems from this perspective that if Christ's enemies are going to be put under his feet, it's just simply going to be at the big smackdown at Armageddon. That's when the enemies are put under his feet. But most of his enemies are not nations or tanks or things like that. They're systems of thought. And do you really subjugate a system of thought by just simply wiping out everybody who holds it? Or do you put those enemies under the feet through the defeat of that system? What if we're going into a really dark period that may last for generations? What if we're going in a really dark period, there's no one alive today that will actually see the end of this dark period? Ooh. That's hard to even think about. But what if we are? Does any of that change the truthfulness of the Christian faith? For a lot of people, it, it does. And that's somewhat of a problem. My commitment is that I want to do everything I can and we may have to do it secretly. We may have to do it underground. We have to do it through the church. We have to do it through teaching our children and our grandchildren. But I want to communicate the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord and what that means in all of its glory. And the fact that mankind in all of his wisdom, dig as deep as you want. All you're going to find is the more you learn about how we exist what the universe is around us, it's all going to end up reflecting the glory of Jesus. He's the creator. He's behind it all. How do I communicate that? How do I pass that down? So they can look back and go, there were those that God used to safeguard, to safeguard the faith. That once for all delivered to the saints' faith. Now, God's going to do it. I want to be in on it. I want to be in on it. I want to endure. And so it does have an impact as to how you're going to respond to the coming global socialist totalitarianism. If you're just waiting for your ticket out, that's going to have some impact on what you're going to be doing between now and whenever the Jackbooted thugs show up to drag you off, right? I want to be very, very actively involved in communicating the faith and in challenging the darkness, being light in the darkness. If the darkness wins, well, but in the end, okay. If it's just at the end, then why have we been going through all this stuff for 2,000 years? I'm glad that Christ is still gathering his elect. And I think about those passages in scripture, it says the elect will be as the sand of the sea. Think about it. Think about it. So I just want to respond. That's not, that's not an accurate representation of post-millennialism, first of all. And secondly, giving your life for the gospel is not losing. It's winning. And it's winning down here. So I know what he was talking about, but I don't think that's the biblical way of looking at it. I really don't. And so your eschatology does have an impact on how you're going to interpret these things, how you're going to understand these things. 